Aloha and welcome to Tough Love with Loretta Chen, where Hawaii's changemakers talk tough on the islands they love. And today's esteemed guest is a professor of accountancy and a director of the Pacific Asian Management Institute, or PAMI, in the Scheidler College of Business Administration at the University of Hawaii. And since joining UH in 1986, Dr. Daniel has served in a number of leadership positions and has generated over 25 million in sponsored research and training programs. She's also a licensed CPA and a past president of the Hawaii Society of CPAs and the Hawaii Chapter of Women Corporate Directors. She currently serves on the board of directors of American Savings Bank and was also recently featured in the book Inspiring Women of Hawaii, where 24 of Hawaii's leaders were profiled. So, this is where I plug. The book that I wrote, <laughs> and I have the privilege and honor of, of uh, uh, interviewing Dr. Daniel. So, of course, I had to take the opportunity to invite her to the studios. So, please welcome Professor Shirley Daniel. Yay! Aloha. Aloha. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, I, I, I am such a huge fan girl of you. I mean, I had the honor of meeting you um, years ago in Singapore. It was a women in business conference at a Singapore Management University, and that was where we met. And we had no idea that years on, we've become firm friends. In fact, I really consider you a, a mentor of mine. But uh, share with our audience, um, how did you end up in Hawaii in 1986? Well, I first came to Hawaii as a professor at the, at the, in the College of Business. Uh, but I came out as a tourist. I visited a friend of mine who I'd gone to college with, and she was working for an accounting firm at the time and mm -hmm. so in the course of uh, visiting her I met some other people and I started thinking about Hawaii but actually it was more of a personal reason that I ended up coming yeah. that and so six years later after getting a PhD and mm -hmm. changing my entire life I uh, ended up coming as a new green assistant professor at uh -huh. the University of Hawaii. Great and then you very quickly made segues and, and, and from accounting you actually made Headway into international business, right? How was that like in, in the 90s? Well, uh, you know, again, in the late 80s, uh, it was the Japanese bubble, really. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a lot of focus on what was going wrong with U.S. manufacturing and what was going right with the Japanese manufacturing. Um, and so there was a lot of interest in academia about what management tools, what uh, business accounting and, and management needed to be changed in the U.S. to compete in the global economy. Mm. And so even though I hadn't really uh, had much experience with that growing up in Oklahoma, right. when I came to Hawaii, there were a lot of international business experts at the College of Business. Mm. And uh, that's one of the wonderful things about the University of Hawaii is that we have such a strong uh, focus on Pacific Asia and Asian uh, culture, language, right. business, yeah. uh, uh, law. And so when I came to the university, I began to see this as a real opportunity for me to right. learn more about Asia. And of course, as a professor, the way mm -hmm. you learn is you do research. That's right. And in fact, now, I mean, you're so involved in the Asian community now, you are actually, you serve as a director of the Pacific Asian Management Institute of OPAMI. Mm -hmm. So you travel a lot to Asia. Yes. Tell us about one of your, your recent trips, because you're recently in, in one of my neighbors, because I'm from Singapore, and, and you just went to my neighboring mm -hmm. country, Kuala Lumpur. That was your last uh, trip to Asia, is that right? Uh, I think so, yeah, last summer. Uh -huh. um, I was very lucky to be appointed in 1995 as the director of the Pacific Asian Management Institute, which was right. actually a center within the College of Business that was started uh, back in the late 70s right. by uh, Dr. Paul Chung. Uh -huh. and. In the late 80s, uh, before I was the leader of PAMI, uh, we had a consortium of business schools from around the Asia Pacific region and several from North America. Right. And uh, so Oceania, North and East, North and South East Asia, right. as well as uh, North America. Right. And so we meet once a year. Right. And so in that process, we learn not only about business in Asia, but education in Asia. Mm. And so all the university deans and mm. international business center directors mm. can meet once a year and we share a lot of information about what's working in our programs, mm -hmm. best practices, mm -hmm. business changes, uh, and it's, it's a very uh, good consortium for us to be yeah. able to be involved in. And I'm, yeah. I've, it's been a privilege of mine to lead the organization. Yeah, so what do you think um, has been some of the key, I mean, I, I know this is a very short program, and this probably leads to a way longer conversation, but what do you think are some of the key differences between 
I was going to say we, but then I'm, I kind of feel like I'm from Singapore and I'm halfway in Singapore and I'm here in Hawaii. So how do you think we are different here in the United States and in Asia? I mean, obviously, I sort of kind of know the difference, but then what do you think? Tell our audience, what do you think are some of the observations that you've met, uh, that, that you've seen? Well, obviously, uh, things have changed a lot over yeah. the 30 years that I've been looking at these issues. You know, uh, in the 50 years ago, you know, the higher education in the U.S. was the model. Yeah. Uh, I would say now that the Asians are catching up very fast. Yeah, thank you and very much. so, uh, you know, there's as much of a two-way uh, learning process yeah. uh, now, yeah. much more than there was perhaps when I first started looking at it That's right. in terms of higher education. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, the population demographics are different in each country. Mm -hmm. So when you go to a place like Malaysia, it's a very young country. Right. And so uh, also still, you know, on the lower end of uh, development uh, in terms of developing countries. Yeah. They, uh, so they have a, an education need and a business climate that takes advantage of or and tries to meet the needs of this young population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so as opposed to if you go to a place like Japan or Korea, mm. it's a much older population. So the, the difference in the competition and the types of programs and the, the uh, class sizes and yeah. things are changing a lot. Yeah. So again, in, in the Southeast Asian countries, you have a, a different educational uh, focus yeah. than perhaps in China or Japan. Or yeah, Korea. and so you, I also saw that you have these, you, you went to the Petronas Tower, right? You spent mm -hmm. some time on Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. and so that was your last PAMI conference. Mm -hmm. So how was that, like, how was that experience like for you? Because I think a lot of people have a, a misconception now of Malaysia, especially, you know, with, with, with regards to Muslim countries, et cetera, right? I mean, mm -hmm. how was your experience like being, being in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur? Well, you know, we have a partner school there that hosted the meeting, the mm -hmm. University of Kabang Sang mm -hmm. in Malaysia, and they really rolled out the red carpet. We got right. our uh, special VIP IP tour of right. the Petronas oh, Towers. Petronas, yeah, we see that. But they yeah. also took us to uh, a lot of the uh, special economic development zones right. that are right there in Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. where we were able to learn about the halal business, mm. uh, halal food right. regulatory system. And one of the goals of, of Malaysia is to become the leader in terms of certifying That's halal right. uh, food that comes in and out mm -hmm. of uh, Muslim countries. That's right. Yeah. And so they, they try to educate importers who mm -hmm. want to import different types of mm -hmm. products, even bottled water. Right. You know, wow. you can get halal, halal certification. Bottled yeah. water. Yeah. And so, and other kind of beauty products, things wow. like shampoos and things like that. There are certain regulation if you want your product to be uh, certified right. as halal. They have a set of, of criteria. Right. So these are things that are very important for if an American business wants to sell to this growing market in Malaysia, right. they may think, oh, this is a way that I can get my product into the country. That's right. You know, I think someone said, if, if you're not doing business of Asia, you're not doing business, period. You know, mm -hmm. and, and on that note, you know, I, I recently went to Big Island and I had a conversation with, with a local in Big Island who, who actually said that we have, we have so many opportunities here in Big Island, right, to, to process food and, and all that. But I just want to take it back to your expertise, which is in international business and in enterprise. Um, a CEO friend of mine said that, you know, many people aren't really keen on establishing businesses in, in, in Hawaii, owing to the high risk of government intervention. And in fact, she cited that potential investors um, hear horror stories, right, um, of permits being stopped or canceled, like the termination of Super Ferry or the ongoing TMT uh, protest. In fact, uh, she was saying that some U.S. Uh, mainland investors even regard Hawaii as an international location and park Hawaii under the Pacific Rim International Fund. Right. So my question to you is, you know, do you think Hawaii today is a hub of international business? I mean, do you truly believe that? Or do you think we have a long ways to go? And, and if so, what can we do? Well, I, I think Hawaii is different, and yeah. that's okay. Yeah. It's a special place. It's an island. We have a, a unique cultural heritage, and it's mm. very important to maintain that. Mm. And if there are certain regulations that are required to uh, keep Hawaii environmentally uh, strong mm. and maintain the culture and mm. and our social values mm. that's okay that's something that businesses can deal with right. i think the main thing is that we are transparent about them right. and that the rules and 
procedures are fair and mm. transparent to mm. everyone. Mm. So I, I don't see it. I mean, every state has their uh, regulations. And, you know, one of the cases that's been made recently is, you know, the environmental regulations and some of the things in California right. have been criticized right. by uh, some industries and some politicians. But you cannot deny that the California economy is one of the strongest in the world, not yeah. just in the U.S. That's right. So I, I think that some of the criticism is just a little bit of, you know, whining. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. that does present opportunities right. for people in Hawaii who are knowledgeable mm. about these cross-country differences right. in regulation yeah. and in culture. Right. And if we can train more people in Hawaii to be the conduit yeah. to help explain to people who want to invest here, this is the way things are here. We understand how you do things. We understand how things are done yeah. perhaps in the U.S. mainland or in yeah. Europe. And this is how to navigate yeah. things. Yeah. And the, then, I, in my opinion, there's a lot of opportunity for people who are, are multicultural, uh, know the, the different legal systems right. and the languages and customs of both their potential customers and investors right. from abroad and locally. And speaking of being a conduit and navigating, I mean, you have been such a champion for, 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 for women, for women in business. In fact, you're one of the founders of the Hawaii chapter of Women Corporate Directors International. In fact, you're, you're going upstairs for, for lunch later on with, with these women. Well, tell us, you know, what prompted you to, to, to start that? Because you're one of the founding uh, members, right? Well, I've been interested in corporate governance for quite a while. Uh, but I have to say that uh, Barbara Tanabe gave me a call, and KPMG, who's the national sponsor for mm -hmm. the Women Corporate Directors, uh, was interested in trying to s start a chapter here. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara's on the board of Bank of Hawaii, and so uh, they actually contacted me and asked me if I'd like to work with them to start the chapter. And so right. I was really uh, privileged to do that and happy to be part of it. And has the climate for, for women leaders changed? I mean, obviously it has, right? I mean, has it, it changed? It is changing. You know, it's slow but uh, steady. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What, what else do you think we, we, we can do? Well, I think awareness is is uh, part of it. But I think the goal of the women corporate directors is to try to help women network with each other, so mm -hmm. that we so that we can help each other when there's yeah. an opening on the boards. We we can let other people know, hey, there's a qualified woman here in town that. Uh, would be a good candidate. Why don't you consider this person? That's right. And education. We we have our seminars are all about current events. Right. We want uh, our members to be better board members, yeah. and we want to have more women right. assigned to boards. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to go for a short break um, soon, but when we come back, we are going to quiz uh, Shirley Moore on obviously how do we get more women involved. We're also going to pick up brains on enterprise as well as education. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life, and the lives of people around you. Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel? Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Well, welcome back, and today we're speaking with Professor Shirley Daniel, who is an accountancy professor and a director of the Pacific Asian Management Institute, OPAMI, in the Scheichler College. 
She's also a licensed CPA and a past president of the Hawaii Society of CPAs and the Hawaii Chapter of Women Corporate Directors. She currently serves on the board of, uh, board of Directors of American Savings Bank. And uh, just before break, I was picking your brains on how we can get more women involved in, in corporate boards, right? Um, so aside from just getting more women involved in corporate boards, how can we inspire more Hawaiians towards enterprise? Because this is my, my quick observation, okay? I haven't been here for, for too long, just about a couple of years. What I've noticed is that I think Hawaiians in general are still pretty risk adverse, except when it comes to surfing. I mean, there they like they go all out. Uh, but when it comes to taking risks with business and their money, I, I think they're still pretty risk adverse, and that's what I think. Many prefer to actually work with the state or work for other enterprises. Um, and when they do take the plunge to set up businesses, I've noticed they set up nonprofits or they tend towards network marketing. I'm, I'm not a fan, I'll say, but. How do you think we can begin to even have this conversation on enterprise and getting people to be more entrepreneurial? Well, I think uh, traditionally in Hawaii, uh, we have a lot of influence on, uh, from the Asia region. Yeah. And so I think particularly on the Japanese side, mm. you know, you have to, uh, you know, one of the largest ethnic groups uh, traditionally here were are the Japanese Americans. And right. that's just culturally, Japanese, we know our Japanese culture is more risk averse. And part right. of it is not, uh, it's the, the fact that you have an obligation. I think if you start to think about uh, the, the reason why they may feel this way, uh, in some societies, and actually even Hawaiian culture is this way, you're in a community, mm. and you have an obligation to the rest of your community. So just making money on your own right. is not necessarily what your key to happiness or your role in society. Right. So your role is to be part of the community. Right. Now, when you fail, you've let down your community. Right. Right. So it's not just your right. failure. It's a failure right. that you have sort of... Uh, created that affects more people. And right. so there's, there's a reluctance to, to do something that you might let other people down or right. let your community down. Yeah, that's such an astute observation, because I remember speaking to Connie Lau, and I, you know, because I, I was thinking like an American, and even though I'm Singaporean, and, and I said, well, how do we encourage people to save? And she says, well, actually, you'd be surprised, Hawaii is actually one of the highest mm -hmm. savings mm -hmm. rate, you know, and, um, across the United States. But, and so you, you're so right on that. I mean, so can I just pick your brains then? I mean, I, I I hear you that there's a sense of obligation and duty. So instead of setting up, say, enterprises or going towards nonprofit, I mean, what about this model of social enterprise? I mean, I'm a huge advocate for social enterprise because I think that it fuses uh, business know-how and being able to seize opportunity, but yet it could also allow for the local Hawaiians to, say, give back to the community, right? I, I feel like this notion of social enterprise hasn't really caught on here in, in Hawaii. I mean, your well, thoughts. I think it's kind of a funny name. So I think you know, if we could come up with a simpler name, maybe it would be to explain it. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, uh, I think that, especially in the younger generation, that they do want to have an enriching career. Right. So again, just a job that you're moving up the corporate ladder may not be that yeah. appealing to the the next generation, unlike m me and my baby boomer uh, counterparts. Oh, hard, yeah. But uh, so I think, you know, having some sort of a mission where you're, you're adding value to society is, is desirable. Right. Uh, the question of how do you set up the enterprise to do that, right. you know, that might be an argument or something to look at in terms of different legal formations. So as an educator and a business person, too, I mean, what you actually did, too, is in the 90s, you worked with Dean David McLean, who found the Pacific Asian Center for Entrepreneurship. So do you think, and I feel like what you're doing is using education as a platform to guide youth, the millennials and the alpha generations to come, to, to sort of gear them up uh, towards having the entrepreneurial mindset, you're guiding them through these educational platforms. I mean, share with us more on, on, on what you have done and, and, and what you are doing. Well, uh in the late 90s, I was able to spend some time and look at other business school activities on the mainland, and I saw that many of them had entrepreneurship centers. Yeah. And we had not yet established one. So when I came back from that uh, study uh, trip to these different schools, I said, we should have an entrepreneurship center. Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, I asked some professors to come out from established programs 
during the summer and teach some courses. And I, we learned from them, and oh. we set up the Pacific Asian Center for Entrepreneurship. Right. And we were very fortunate that we got some donations from uh, investors, uh, uh, local community people, and some from California. And also at that time, the, the governor uh, also helped to seed our entrepreneurship center. So we got started on a program. We developed a number of courses mm -hmm. and an annual business plan activity. Mm. And the program has grown since then. Wow. And uh, again, the, the idea is to try to expose students to successful entrepreneurs as role models. Right and to allow them to have some practice right. to develop a, a business idea and uh, sort of get it strength tested or stress tested in right. a business plan competition. Right. And so we, you know, there's a whole uh, process that actually will be starting in January oh, every wow. year. We, we have it in the summer or in wow. the spring semester rather. Starting so they can in find January. it on, online and in the Scheidler? Yeah, if, if you look at the Pacific Asian Center for Entrepreneurship in the Scheidler College, right. you'll see information about the business plan competition that's going to be starting. What are some of the biggest success stories from the business plan competition? I mean, off the top of your head. Well, um, I have to say uh, we've had a number of really great ideas. Some of the best ideas are when our business students pair up with those in the sciences. So you uh -huh. don't have to just be a business student exactly. to participate. You just need to have one person on the team be right. a UH student. Right. And so I guess one that's close to my heart is my friend uh, over in electrical engineering, mm -hmm. uh, Magdi Iskandar, who won a couple of years ago with a medical device that he developed wow. to try to uh, detect uh, lung fluid which is a problem for heart failure patients wow. and actually a number of diseases. And so is that he's, already in the market? or he, He's been developing it. He's gotten a couple of NIH grants since then and uh, trying to uh, uh, keep developing the technology and, uh, on that. Wow, that's amazing. So, and on that note, like, you know, again, going back to enterprise and education, right? I mean, you, you are obviously a huge uh, believer in education. You shared with me that, that your best investment has been your education. So given the high cost of, of college, I mean, we were just talking that we have all these great competitions, et cetera, in, in, in UH. But what do we do if some of these students aren't in UH? I mean, are there ways to help them get access to education? I think you're working on something, right? To well, we have programs that, we, uh, that I have been associated with in the past, the Gear Up program, right. where we developed uh, ways to go down uh, into the junior highs and try to get people in the junior high to start thinking about college. You know, if, you're, if your parents never went to college or you don't yeah. know someone other than maybe your school teacher, which yeah. is not necessarily you don't think of as your friend, right. uh, if you don't have a personal relationship with someone who went to college, you may not think of it as something that you could do. Right. So one of the first things is to, to get students and their parents to realize that college is possible for them. Mm. And college doesn't necessarily mean going through a four-year program. It can mean going to one of our excellent community colleges. Mm -hmm. I know you're teaching it. That's at right. The, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Leroux. Leroux. we plug Lee right uh, Come to Lee Root. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, there are a variety of, of uh, skill sets that yeah, you can learn absolutely. through the community college yeah. while you try to figure out what your career path is going to be. And yeah. some of them are in healthcare, some are in the building trades, yeah. uh, some are uh, in uh, other kinds of computer technology. Right. And uh, each of the community colleges has some really unique programs, even things that are focused on Native Hawaiian cultural practices and right. fishing and farming and things, uh, as well as our excellent culinary programs right. that. Uh, train people for all of the world-class hotels and restaurants yeah. that are here in Hawaii. And I'm actually really interested in that, so I'm going to quiz you a little bit more on, on your Native Hawaiian initiatives, because obviously I teach out in Leeward, mm -hmm. and I also started like a, a theater program in, in the Waianae Moku campus, and I realized that um, there, there is a huge interest now, you know, especially when I go out there to the Waianae Moku site, like these students are actually inspired, like they want to come to school. And, and it, it was not a possibility for them, so what we did was we, we took college to them, and we have now a campus there mm -hmm. in Waianae Moku. But my question to you is that in 1998, you and your, your staff led a proposal development for the Native Hawaiian Leadership Program, right? Well, share with us a little bit more about that and where that is now today. Well, the uh, program was uh, uh, 
grant opportunity with the U.S. Department of Education, mm -hmm. and I worked with a few others, and my very good friend, Manu Kaiyama, mm -hmm. who uh, became the principal investigator for the program when we got the federal funding. Right. And she ran that program for maybe eight or ten years. I'm not sure how many. Yeah. But the focus was to try to not only provide scholarships for Native Hawaiians to go to college, but also to develop leaders by uh, funding faculty, Native Hawaiian mm -hmm. faculty, to, mm -hmm. so that they can get tenure. We had graduate uh, scholarships so that uh, you could not just finish uh, undergraduate, which is where a lot of financial aid focus is, is on yeah. the undergraduate. Sometimes in certain fields, you, you need a master's degree or even a PhD. Right. And so we funded some uh, uh, graduate work. Mm. And uh, so then when that program was sort of rearranged by the Department of Education, mm. uh, she was working with the Kamehameha schools right. to try to uh, continue some parts of it. And then this last year, they've gotten a new grant. Wow. And so they're funding some uh, more graduate scholarships and some other programs mm -hmm. uh, under that program, uh, under that new grant. So, wow. Uh, Amazing. You know, she's a, you know, my friend Manu is, is an excellent, strong leader within the well, Hawaiian sure, community. Uh, like attracts like. But, but on that note, I have to congratulate you. You yourself just won a Fulbright scholarship or grant, right? Well, I'm in the process of hopefully getting Oops, Fulbright. Am I to win? <laughs> the I'm U.S. Uh, the I'm U.S. Sure you get it. The, the U.S. Uh, phase was successful, so now it's in the hands of the European side uh, to see if they will fund my project. To, but I'm, I'm hoping to do some Europe, uh, some research. Next fall, when I'm on Ooh. sabbatical on uh, the new restructuring directive that the EU. I know, I was looking at photos where you're on a research project. I'm always so jealous, right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, on that note, while I dream of uh, spending Christmas in Europe, I thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daniel. Thank you so much for, for being here. And for all of you, thank you so much for watching Tough Love with Loretta Chan. Because, you know, tough times don't last, but tough people like Shirley, they do. And so will you. Well, join us next year where we'll see you in our brand new studio. Well, till then, season's greetings and Meli Kaliki Maka in advance. See you next time. Bye-bye.